Hey everybody, it's just a few news uh, clips that I want to share with you. The first one is going to be New York City. Well, they are the first to perform the first ever heart transplant from an HIV positive donor. And they hope that this breakthrough will help to tame America's massive shortage of heart donations. The first ever HIV positive heart transplant was performed in the Bronx, New York during the spring. The unnamed unnamed patient is 60 years old. She's in her 60s, it says, and that she's also received a new kidney from the same donor. Until 2013, these types of operations were banned and even now can only be performed for research purposes. Advocates are hoping that restrictions on HIV positive organ donors will be lifted, providing more potential treatments for people in need. With over 100,000 Americans awaiting a new organ and more than a dozen people on that list dying each day, doctors are hopeful that even the slightly expanding pool of donors will allow more lives to be saved. Matching HIV positive patients to other HIV positive donors could also allow for a more efficient use of other resources. This is something that has not been done before. It is a part of a broader effort to use organs that have historically not been used. This comes from David Kat Klassen, who's the chief medical officer there in New York for the organ sharing. That's it. Network for organ sharing. Uh, the demand for the new organs will always exceed available supply across the world. Official data shows that 106,000 200, oh, I'm sorry, 106,023 Americans are waiting for a donation of an organ right now as of today, Friday, the 29th of July. For comparison, around only 40,000 transplants are performed every year, and this leads to many people dying while awaiting the new organ, and the list of potential recipients is regularly growing as well. Heart transplants in particular can be hard to find. The recipients must hope an eligible donor emerges whose cause of death did not damage their heart. And we've got a little bit more news here. We're going to take a look at a search warrant that has been issued. The United States gets a warrant to search the phone of Trump's election attorney, John Eastman. The United States Justice Department said on Wednesday that it got a warrant to search the phone of former President Donald Trump's election attorney, John Eastman, who spoke at a rally before the January 6, 2021 assault on the U.S. Capitol. Federal agents in June seized Eastman's phone based on a warrant authorizing them to take the device. They needed a second warrant to search the phone's contents. In a filing with the United States District Court in New Mexico, assisting U.S. Attorney Thomas Wyndham said that the United States District Court for the District of Columbia on July 12th issued a search warrant authorizing the review of the phone's contents and manual screen capture. He also said that federal agents in North Virginia had the phone and the screenshots of some of its contents. Eastman has been under intense scrutiny in the probes until the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol by Trump supporters after the former president falsely claimed that he had won the 2020 election. Okay, there's enough of that. All right, the links to this story will be down below in the description. And uh, let's go into a couple of more stories just while we're, you know, glossing over some of these and get you through your weekend or at least get your weekend started. Now, I don't know whether you know it or not, but did you know that some ICU patients actually need less oxygen? According to a study, they need less oxygen treatment than needed. A flaw in a widely used medical device that measures oxygen levels causes ill, critically ill, listen to this, causes critically ill Asians, Blacks, and Hispanics to receive less supplemental oxygen to help them breathe than white patients. Wow. He really took the time to do this study. Well, let's dive right in. According to data from a large study published on Monday, pulse oximeters, oximeter clips onto the fingertips and pass red and far red light through the skin to gauge the oxygen levels in the blood. It has been known since the 1970s that skin pigmentation can throw off the readings, which is what I was thinking. I was like, huh, all of those folks have some melanin in them. But anyway, 
They said that the skin pigmentation can throw off the readings, but the discrepancies were not believed to affect patient care. Among 3,069 patients treated in Boston Intensive Care Unit between 2008 and 2019, people of color were significantly less supplemented. So they were giving less supplemental oxygen than would be considered optimal compared to white people because of the inaccuracies in the pulse oximeter readings related to their skin pigment, the study found. Quote, nurses and doctors make the wrong decisions and end up giving less oxygen to the people of color because they are fooled by incorrect readings from the pulse oximeters, the doctor said. Dr. Leo Anthony Seeley of Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts East Institute of Technology, who actually oversaw the study. Again, the links to those stories will be down below in the description. And here's a couple of more stories that just might sort of make you wonder why they keep bringing this up, because it appears to me that there's something. I just can't can't put my finger on it, but let's go and read it. There are cheap copies of GSK HIV prevention drugs, and they could be ready in 2026. British drug maker GSK has struck a deal to allow low-cost generic versions of the long-acting HIV preventative medicine to be used in the developing world, including the sub-Saharan Africa, where the virus remains a leading cause of death. Each year, roughly 1.5 million new cases of HIV are recorded globally, most of which occur in resource-limited countries and disproportionately impact women and adolescent girls. The deal involves the GSK issuing a voluntary license so the intellectual property does not get in the way to the United Nations-backed healthcare organizations, the Medicines Patent Pool, MPP. So following that, the MPP offers generic manufacturers the opportunity to, to apply to make a copycat version of the injected drug. Okay, that's the Cabot Gavir, Cabot Gavir, for the 90 countries that represent 70% of all the new HIV cases in 2020. Pre-exposure or pro, uh, prophylaxis is in effect a way for an anti or an at-risk HIV negative person to reduce their risk of infection. But until recently, pre-EP was only available in the pill form taken daily or in some cases before and after sex. This is partly why it's being used by a fraction of people that are eligible globally, and there is particularly poor uptake in poorer countries. Hmm. You know, they're really dealing with this particular disease a lot lately, and I think it's because of the other one. <clears throat> I think the other one had some stuff that maybe that uh, that this was in. This was in some of that stuff. That's what I think. Anyway, monkeypox. <laughs> the monkeypox emergency could last months with window closing to stop the spread. Boy, oh boy, when they get one going, they really get on one, don't they? Well, the monkeypox emergency could last months with window closing to stop the spread. Scientists advising the World Health Organization, or the WHO, on monkeypox say the window is closing to stop the spread, with cases currently doubling every two weeks, raising concerns that it may take several months for the outbreak to peak. The WHO Europe has forecast just over 27,000 monkeypox cases in 88 countries by August 2nd, up from 17,800 cases in nearly 70 countries at last count. Making predictions beyond that are complex, scientists around the world told Reuters. But there is likely to be a sustained transmission for several months, and possibly longer, they said. You know, this actually mimics the other thing that we just talked about. Think about what I'm saying. Okay. So now there is a professor named Anne Ramon. She says, quote, we have to get in the front of this, she said. She's an epidemiologist professor at the University of California in Los Angeles. She continues with, it's clear the window of opportunity for doing so is closing. Okay. Added Ramon, a member of the WHO expert committee on monkeypox that met last week to determine whether the outbreak constituted a global health emergency. I guess they're just trying out their new, their new wheels that they got issued to them a few months ago. So anyway, it goes on to tell us that a majority of the committee members voted against the move and in an unprecedented step, the WHO director 
uh, purchasable Tedros Adhanem Gebrasis declared an emergency anyway. Action stemming from the declaration needs to be urgent, including increasing vaccination, testing, isolation for those infected, and contact tracing, global health experts said. The transmission is clearly unchecked. This came from this came uh, from Anton Flaut, 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 Float, whatever. The director of the Institute of Global Health at the University of Geneva, who chairs the WHO Europe Advisory Group. Okay, that's what that's what they feel. That's what they think. That's what's going on. They're just prepping you. That's all. They're just prepping you for some stuff that you know that they already know about. That's it. And if you ever stop to wonder who are the Americans that are held captive abroad, well, the plight of Americans detained by foreign governments has moved into the spotlight with the case of the U.S. basketball um, lady, Brittany Greiner, who was on trial in Moscow on drug charges. Since she was arrested in February, the United States President Joe Biden has faced increased pressure to bring her home. Detained Americans, they want them to bring them all home. Although the United States government does not provide figures, there are more than 60 such detainees, according to the James Foley Foundation, named after an American journalist abducted and killed in Syria. The foundation says the United States citizens are wrongfully detained in about 18 countries. Most are held by United States adversaries such as Iran, Russia, and Venezuela, which seek either cash or major changes in the United States foreign policy for their release. There are some of the United States citizens and residents whose detentions are designated as wrongful by Washington and the countries holding them. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> thing is very funny, very very telling actually, that you go and you start begging people like Venezuela, and they have your people there, and you're begging them for oil. Boy, I tell you, the lack of cojones in Washington these days is amazing. Now, the State Department has so far publicly designated two of several detainees in Russia as wrongfully detained, a term that transfers in the case to the special envoy for hostage affairs and raises the detainee's profile. Griner, the 31-year-old woman's National Basketball Association player, played in Russia during the league's offseason and was detained at Moscow's airport on February the 17th with a vape cartridge containing cannabis oil in her luggage. The two-time Olympic gold medalist has pleaded guilty to the charges against her, uh, but she denies that she intended to break Russian's law, Russia's law. And if found guilty, she, she could face up to 10 years in prison. You know, it's amazing. We go to other countries and we sort of think it'll, things will slide because we get comfortable. But their laws are their laws. They're not like us here. You know, we have written laws on the books, but... We don't keep them. And so I guess we get a little comfortable thinking, ah, they're not going to say anything. Just a little bit of oil. No big deal. Just a cartridge. I'm not taking any for everybody. It's just for me. Personal use, personal use. American citizen, that's who I am. But it doesn't work like that. When you go elsewhere. Hmm. Boy. So the former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan, who holds um, U.S., British, Canadian, and Irish passports, was sentenced in 2020 to 16 years in jail for spying. Now he's over there and the Federal Security Service detained him on December 18th, 28th of 2018. He denied spying and said that he was set up on a sting operation. There are folks that are in Iran. There's a father and son who has been held and um, released. And there are just so many different problems. And then there's the Iran Iranian American businessman, Imad uh, Shargi, Shargi who moved to Iran from the United States in 17. He was arrested in 18 and was released on bail after eight months. A revolutionary court cleared him of spying and other charges, but kept a travel ban on him. So there's lots of folks, whole lot of people. When you get down into this, click the link, read it, see exactly how many folks we have abroad. Listen, there's even people in Rwanda. Rwanda is holding a gentleman by the name of Paul Ruzis Bagnia, Bagina, excuse me, Bagina, Woo. a political dissident charged with terrorism. The other offenses last month and other offenses uh, the last month after his nearly arrest a year ago. 
after his arrest nearly a year ago. So now there's lots of people. There's folks in Syria, the American freelance journalist and former Marine Austin Tice disappeared in Syria in 2012 at age 31. Wow. While reporting on the uprising of Syrian president Bashar al-Assad. So there are many, many people keep them lifted up, especially for those who are, um, you know, detained and uh, been there for so long, um, been in different countries for a long, long time. So that's pretty much about it. I mean, it is not a lot of a bunch of other stuff going on. Oh, well, there's one. The gene editing biotechnology appears to completely inhibit the 19. Scientists at Duke Health, a major research center in North Carolina, have developed a method that takes advantage of clustered regular, clustered, regularly interspaced, short, plant palindromic, palindrome, trying to say plant palindrome, palindromic repeats or CRISPR technology in order to prevent and treat the infections. According to the research report, which was published by Nature Chemical Biology Journal earlier this week, this is the first time that CRISPR techniques, which is uh, involving the gene editing, has been investigated in relation to the coronavirus pandemic, aside from the principles of the messenger RNA vaccines. In essence, CRISPR technique applied to laboratory mice by Duke researchers makes the cellular structure of the lungs and inhospitable environment for SARS-CoV-2 particles. All vaccines and treatments thus far developed to protect against the 19, focus on antibody and immune response. The use of CRISPR is a smart approach that could be delivered through inhalers in the future. (laughs) Wow. The researchers plan to conduct more laboratory tests before applying the limited clinical trials later this year. And the U.S. president does recover from COVID-19 this past week after being treated with Plaxlovid and monoclonal antibody formulas. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So he got to use monoclonal antibody formulas? Really? Well, the United States President Joe Biden returned to work in the Oval Office on Wednesday. The 79-year-old Biden was subject to a breakthrough infection causing the Omicron, caused by the Omicron BA variant. He probably caught the virus during his tour in the Middle East, they say, a couple of weeks ago. Now, during his quarantine period, Biden stayed in the second floor of the White House. (laughs) I wanted to throw mine on in there, peering out the window like, oh, look at everybody, they're playing. Oh, well, I'll go back to sleep now. Anyway. It says that he stayed in the state in the second floor of the White House while First Lady retreated to their home in Delaware. Let me get up out of here. Call me if anything changes, but I got to go. Now, the Ukrainian forces gradually approached captured city. I'm not even going to read it. I see it, but I ain't even going there. An American lottery player hoped to win $1 billion jackpot. Whoa. So on Tuesday night, people across the United States paid close attention to the drawing of the Mega Millions Lottery, which did not yield a jackpot winner, thus increasing the amount of the top payout to a billion dollars. Let's all quickly, quickly throw in a penny, Christina. Let's all gather enough money to become Mega Million winners. Throw a penny at everybody. Goes on to say the last time a lottery jackpot in the United States was worth a billion dollars was in 2016. When the Powerball reached $1.56 billion following months of drawings that did not match a ticket. Starting this weekend, the winner of the Mega Millions jackpot will have the option to cash out on the spot after paying nearly $400 million in taxes. Take it, take it, take it, take that, take that, take that. I want to go over here and get me some gold. Then I want to go over here and get me this. And I'm going to go make sure I invest in this and invest in that. Yeah go over here and invest. That's what I'm going to do. Sports gamblers show interest in the Tour de France. Hmm. The Femmes. Are they really the Femmes? The women's version of the Tour de France, the most celebrated bicycle race in the world, 
is back in the spotlight after having been on hold for years. In the past, this race was mostly overlooked by sports gamblers. But things, they are a change in this year. At sports books in some European capitals, players are specifically asking for Tour de France wagers. And they like the odds for stars such as Anamiek Van Vluten, Elisa Longo Borghini, and Marianne Voss. The tour organizers are hoping that this enthusiasm will continue with next year's edition. Hmm. So that's pretty much it. Nothing else. Let's see if there's any... Uh, I really don't like reading the threat news and terrorism. I don't like reading all that. Because uh, you never know who's on there. But I mean, oh well. Let's see about any public services, public service announcements. We already looked at some of the products the other day. Government agencies, if you are a government agency or a nonprofit, you can put your information here. Okay, there you go. All right, well... That's it. You're going to see all of this and more down below in the production notes. You'll be able to look and see all of the stories that we've read and a whole bunch more, baby. There's a whole lot of stuff in here, actually. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Wait a minute. One thing I did want to talk about was this former Obama advisor getting sentenced to prison uh, in a school theft case. Now, listen. Seth Andrew was sentenced by the U.S. District Judge John Cronin in Manhattan. He's a former White House education advisor under President Barack Obama, and he was sentenced on Thursday to one year and one day in prison after pleading guilty to charges that he stole more than $200,000 from a charter school network that he founded. Andrew had previously paid $218,005 in restitution to the network Democracy Prep Public Schools. Well, he's teaching them what they do. What's the problem? Leave the man alone. It's what they do. He's only teaching them, just giving them life lessons. So this, it says, which teaches mostly lower income people and forfeited another $22,537. Lawyers for Andrew did not immediately respond to the request for a comment. And the prosecutors allege that in 2019, Andrew looted escrow accounts for Democracy Prep School so that he and his wife could qualify for a lower rate mortgage on a $2.37 million apartment they bought in Manhattan's Central Park West. Andrew had left the network two years earlier. His wife was not accused of wrongdoing. And uh, here's a quote for you. Seth Andrew was sentenced today for stealing from those who once trusted him. After the network had declined his offer to return as its leader, the United States Attorney Damian Williams in Manhattan said in a statement, Andrew joined the United States Department of Education in 2013 and later became the senior advisor in the White House's Office of Educational Technology. Prosecutors had sought a one and three quarters year prison term. Andrew had sought home confinement plus three years of probation. He said greed had not motivated him and the transferred money ended up with another nonprofit helping the same children he thought Democracy Prep should prioritize. <laughs> Founded in 2005, Democracy Prep is said to operate. It operates 21 schools with more than 6,000 students in New York, Louisiana, Nevada, and Texas. Why haven't we ever heard of this? Causes me to dig, pull some threads. When you give me some threads, I start pulling. I start to pull, and I get ideas. I get ideas. All right, here's another quote for you. We are grateful. This sad chapter is finally closed. The organization, Democracy Prep, said in a statement, get that, founded in 2005. Democracy Prep said that it operates 21 schools, more than 6,000 students in New York, Louisiana, Nevada, and Texas. Huh? Hmm. Huh. Huh. Who are these masked people? A little unmasking ought to do the job. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to look and see who they are. Democracy Prep. Huh. I wonder what kind of kids they teach. I know they said that they are in, um, you know, 
lower communities or whatever because they did say you know black and you know you know melanated but there's one in baton rouge that's home base huh let's get some images of this stuff and i guess i'll show you guys what we find what is this democracy prep public schools huh baton rouge hmm i don't know y'all Hmm. Wow, some of the mess they must be teaching these poor kids. I can only imagine what a nightmare, a horror show it might be. Let me show you guys this and then we're going to get up out of here. But these are photos of the babies right here. Okay. I don't like how I can never put it back in the single screen anymore. Huh. No. But this is them. This is this is Baton Rouge. Right about there. <clears throat> Look at him. Poor little babies. He's looking like I do not feel like carrying this drum. I didn't even want to play this. I really want to play the clarinet. But they made me play it. They made me play it. They made me play it. Look at him. He's like, no, I don't think so. All right, let's see who we have here. Here's Democracy Prep. Oh, they have a Twitter page. Well, let's look at that. That's probably a lot easier to get a gander. Yeah, okay. Much easier. Let me let me, let, let, let me give it to you. Hold on. Let me show you. Let me show you. Right there. Okay. Let me know. All righty, and we're gonna put enter just to see what we can see. 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 Yeah. Okay. So this is their Twitter feed. This is the one for Baton Rouge. Huh. Okay. Huh. Well, looks like they got some pretty decent stuff going on. I don't know, but for this guy to be able to take that cut that type of money. They had to have some pretty bad luck. Wouldn't you say? Returning family orientation. Huh. Let's see. This is the children here. Where do these kids come from? This is Baton Rouge? I don't think so. Huh. Look at these folks still up here doing their advertisement. Look at this. Please, please. Wow, this don't look like Baton Rouge to me. This looks like a place where they've just funneled some people to go and sit for a minute and learn their ways while they uh, take over the rest of the world. I know I always think like Pinky in the Brain, but oh well, oh well. All right, you guys, we're close to an hour. So I just wanted to bring a couple of these little things to you and talk about it and see what you thought about it. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, pretty much it. What's going on here? Oh, some stuff I don't want to get into. What is this? Important notice. Democracy prep, prep Baton, Baton Rouge will be closed tomorrow, Thursday, March. Oh, that's something. Well, I'm all the way back in 2019, which means they must not post a lot. But this doesn't look like Baton Rouge to me. I'm sorry. Where did these people come from? Where did they come from? Huh. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. They could have easily brought in some people who are very progressive in their thought process. Stuck them down there and that's it. This is from 18. On what would have been the 89th birthday, we are honored. We honored Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his words continue to inspire us to make positive change in the world no matter what the obstacles we may face. Okay. All right, y'all, I'm done. Enough is enough, I say. Enough is enough. All right, you guys. Well, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm just out of here, man. I'm just out of here because, as you can see, I'm not here, but I'm here. I'm here with you, but I'm not. But I am, but I'm not. Yeah, but I'm here. <laughs> All right, y'all, we're going to go ahead and head out. Remember what we always say. 
First off, before we say what we always say, I need to make sure that you know that uh, if you want to make sure that you know when we are live, baby, just do me a big favor right now. You can hit the like button. You can make sure that you are still connected to us by uh, confirming that, hey, you still have the little thing that says you are subscribed and that the bell notification is marked. Also, what Monograph always suggests is, you know, unsubscribing, clear out your cache, and then waiting a few minutes and then going back and clicking the, you know, subscribe button and then the bell notification. That's what works. He says sometimes it gets a little backed up like that. So, you know, he knows this stuff. He knows this stuff. He knows it. All right. All right. Well, y'all take care. Remember what we always say on any of the Felicia Lockhart Group publications, and that is that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Most High. You guys continue to take care of yourselves first and then reach around and take care of somebody else. And until we see each other again, please continue to be blessed. To receive instant notification each time I upload, please hit the subscribe button and the bell notification. Helping you.